All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our presentation today, Pet Food Manufacturing Pain Points. This is our first ever digital conference offered by Eurofin Scientific. We will begin with session one, but before we get started, I'd like to take care of a few housekeeping opportunities. Before we begin, I want everyone to know that this entire digital conference is being recorded. A copy of all of the slides and a recording of each session will be distributed to everyone who registered and everyone who attended within two business days. So everyone will have a copy of these by Thursday. There will be a question answer period following each individual session. And before we go further, I want to make sure that everyone can see and hear our digital conference clearly today. So any of our attendees, if you are experiencing audiovisual troubles, um, if you can't hear clearly or if there's background noise, please send me a message in the chat. So you might be wondering, who's talking to us? Right now, um, my name is Sarah Curran. I'm the Marketing Communications Specialist with Eurofin Scientific, and I will be navigating a lot of the housekeeping um, portions of this presentation. And along with me, I have Lars Riemann. Lars, would you like to introduce yourself? I'm Lars Riemann, and I've had the pleasure of working with the pet food industry for many years, and I'm here to <laughs> talk about. Yep. So Lars will be offering insight throughout our presentation, but we also have um, 10 highly qualified, wonderful presenters today. And without further ado, um, I want to explain to you guys how to ask questions of those presenters. So really quickly, if you have a question that comes to mind during our live presentation, please submit them using the question box in your GoToWebinar dashboard. You simply select questions from one of the um, panels on the side, and you type your question, hit enter, those questions will be put into a queue for me to pitch to our presenters in between each session. A little bit about Eurofins before we get started. Eurofins is driven by our mission to contribute to global health by offering the highest quality testing, training, auditing, consulting services. We strive to listen to customers and not simply meet but exceed their expectations. Our footprint is global with over 35,000 staff in 400 laboratories across 44 countries and a portfolio of over 150,000 analytical methods, Eurofins provides a unique range of analytical testing to the pharmaceutical, food, environment, and consumer products industries. With that, I'd like to move into session one. I'll give everyone a moment to look at the agenda for what's up for session one. And our, the first part of our session one will be FISMA and GFSI requirements with Gary Smith. So Gary, if you'd like to take yourself off mute and introduce yourself really quickly. Sure, Sarah, thanks very much. And thanks everyone for joining us this morning. Uh, Sarah said, my name is Gary Smith, Vice President of Eurofins Food Safety Systems. Um, and I'm gonna speak to you for a few minutes this morning over uh, some things about FISMA, the Food Safety and Modernization Act. We're going to talk a little bit about that and some of the basic requirements for the pet food industry and then explain a little bit about the global food safety initiative and and some of the third party certification that's available for pet food and then talk just a little bit about some of those uh, considerations that one has to go into or consider when starting up i guess a, a pet food or as you're entering into compliance with fisma or the gfsi standards uh, some of the things to talk about things like pathogen compliance, environmental monitoring, allergen management, and process validation, which are many of those which are now required under the new uh, FISMA regulation. So uh, looking forward to speaking to you here for the next few minutes. So next slide, Sarah, please. All right, so when we talk about uh, the Food Safety Modernization Act for animal food, we start with uh, it's in now the Code of Federal Regulations in 507, and there's a few pieces to it. Obviously, you see all the subparts here on your screen. Uh, what are most significant and what we're going to talk about now, this is the preventive control and uh, GMP part of the rules. So there's seven rules under FISMA. Um, this is one of them. And the two main pieces we're going to cover here in this discussion of the preventive control rule are the current good manufacturing practices, which is parts B, 
and part C, which is the hazard analysis and risk-based preventive controls, or sometimes we just call them the preventive controls. Uh, so those are the two sections we're going to cover, and then we'll talk a little bit about the foreign supplier verification program as well, which is another one of the FISMA rules. So in, in looking at the uh, current good manufacturing practices, we've got eight subsections of that, uh, subpart B, and these are very similar, if you're familiar at all, with the human food GMPs. Uh, these are very, very similar. Um, there's one piece that is not included, which is allergen management. But if you look at the eight pieces, uh, we start with personnel, dealing with cleanliness of employees, some recommendations on, or not recommendations, requirements on hand washing, use of jewelry, hairnets, clothing. Now, if you haven't had a chance to read the GMPs, which I, you know, can certainly understand, they're not the most exciting things to read. But um, what we see is that there's a lot of language like, you know, employees shall have satisfactory clean hands, uh, the cleanliness of the facility shall be satisfactory, adequate protection, it, you know, for hand washing, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of those types of words which, you know, we, we talk about. It gives a lot of flexibility, but it certainly also gives a lot of room for interpretation as well. Uh, so we go through personnel, then we talk about the plants and grounds, making sure we don't have any harborage areas or pest uh, attractants. We talk about uh, sanitary operations. Again, is the facility in clean and in good repair, adequate sanitation, prevention of cross-contamination. Uh, pest control is included in that section as well. I know in the animal food industry, many times we talk about hygiene instead of sanitation. So that's what would be covered in this section here. Uh, next. And then we get into things like water supply and plumbing, and we have to make sure that we have potable water, especially if it's used in the facility for hygiene, sanitation activities, or as an ingredient. Talk about hand washing facilities, toilet facilities for employees to make sure, again, they're adequate is what the language there says. Uh, equipment and utensils, um, proper design, no contamination, those types of things. Again, plant operations designed in such a way to minimize contamination to the product, uh, proper holding and distribution, uh, labeling. Now, one of the uh, unique pieces here is is the last section, which talks about human food byproducts. So this is basically where, if if you're a human food facility and you're supplying ingredients to animal food facilities, unfortunately, many times in the past, those human food facilities would treat those uh, byproducts much like trash, really, and, and and many times they were indistinguishable from their uh, inedible product. Um, so now there's a provision in the rule that says that for those human food facilities that are byproducts to animal food, they cannot treat it like trash. They have to properly label it. They have to protect it from contamination. They have to protect it during storage and those types of things. So uh, provisions there really that part of the CGMPs for animal food, pet food, but really focused on those human food facilities, which are producing um, animal ingredient byproducts through their through their uh, uh, production of human food. Uh, one of the things about the GMPs as we as we close out on this section is that they do not have to be written for FISMA as we know. Uh, there does have to be some training requirements, some basic training on food safety and hygiene for all employees, everyone in the facility, but the, the GMPs themselves do not have to be written out or documented. Uh, they're basically just, you know, they have to be followed by the facility as part of FISMA compliance. Uh, next, we'll move on to the preventive control rule. And in the preventive control rule, unlike GMPs that didn't have to be documented, now we have documentation requirements. So we must have a written food safety plan that must include a written hazard analysis. Uh, and when that hazard analysis defines that we have preventive controls that require, or food safety hazards that require preventive control, we must define those and those preventive controls focus around things like process preventive control, sanitation preventive control, uh, or uh, supplier preventive control. So those are the three main preventive controls for the uh, pet food, animal food industry. And when we have a preventive control that's in place, we must include things like monitoring, uh, documented monitoring, documented corrective actions, documented verification, and validation activities. We'll talk more about both of those in just a second. Uh, if your supplier is addressing a hazard on your behalf and you do not address that hazard in your in your uh, process, so let's say, for example, you may be receiving corn 
for your pet food facility and you realize in your hazard analysis you have aflatoxin as a concern in that corn and that that supplier is really the only one who deals with that aflatoxin for you once you get it there's really nothing you can do about it you'll have to build a supplier preventive control for that uh, for that supplier of that corn product for you um, every time you or anytime you have a preventive control as defined in your food safety plan you must include a documented recall process in there as well and then of course with uh, you know all of the uh, documentation and the and the monitoring activities and corrective actions, et cetera, records are required for each of those activities to show to the agency, the FDA, when they come in to verify that, you know, those controls are being followed and being met. So a much, you know, very significant. So this is part C of the rule, and it's a, a very significant documentation requirement on the, the pet food industry. Next, we'll go to see about the preventive control. So the, the preventive control qualified individual is defined in the rule as an individual who has either taken a training class in preventive controls that's offered by the Food Safety Preventive Control Alliance. That's the curriculum. Eurofins offers that. There's many other folks who do as well, and we've, we've trained quite a few of the pet food industry. Um, or equivalent experience through your career. Now, as we've talked to the agency about, you know, what defines the criteria to determine if somebody is a qualified individual, preventive control qualified individual, uh, the agency has described that there really is no criteria established and, you know, really you need to take the training class. So we're advising, highly, highly advising everyone uh, to at least have uh, an identified preventive control qualified individual for your facility prior to your implementation date, which we'll talk about those in just a second. Now, what is the preventive control qualified individual? What do they have to do? Uh, as defined in the rule, they have to prepare the food safety plan. So they have to develop it. They have to validate your preventive control. Now we know in the rule, we'll talk more about validation in just a minute, but validation of your process preventive control. So this could be things like your extruder. This could be things like perhaps a metal detector. This could be things like, uh, you know, some of those types of, of, of processes. Uh, those have to have validation. So only process preventive controls have to have validation. Uh, one key attribute that, that gives some folks in the industry a little bit of heartburn, records created from the food safety plan must be reviewed by the preventive control qualified individual within seven days. So that means basically every monitoring record of, of a process preventive control or a supplier preventive control or a sanitation preventive control or corrective actions or verifications, all those records must have a monitor signature, the person who's doing the activity, and then it must be reviewed within seven days by that preventive control qualified individual. Uh, and then the final activity is they must have perform a reanalysis of the food safety plan at least every three years. So no written food safety plan can be more than three years old for any facility under FISMA. Now, one key point there to recognize is that the, the, the person that the facility names as their preventive control qualified individual does not have to be an employee. Uh, they can be, you know, a contractor or a consultant or something like that as well. Uh, so they do not have to be an employee of the company. Okay, next, sir. Now, another rule within FISMA that we're going to real briefly talk about is the Foreign Supplier Verification Program. What is that? Uh, that basically says that if you import products from not a U.S. manufacturer, then you're responsible. If you're the importer who is bringing that product into the, to the U.S., you're responsible for verifying that that importer is essentially meeting the preventive control rule. So if you're bringing an ingredient in from, from international suppliers into the United States and you're the importer of that product, you have to comply with the Foreign Supplier Verification Program, which essentially says you have to do a hazard determination of your supplier. You have to make sure that their, you know, their, their performance is there. They're meeting the rule through an on-site audit or a visit. Um, determine verification procedures, which includes an on-site audit, potentially testing, uh, depending on what type of product they're producing for you, uh, conduct those supplier verification activities, so either the on-site audit or the analysis, the testing, and then conduct corrective actions when your monitoring finds out that you potentially, you know, have issues either in the audit or the monitoring activities. 
Thanks. So we're going to talk now, shift gears a little bit. One of the other rules of FISMA is third-party certification, and a lot of people are, are confused as to how that fits in or where does that fit. Basically, the, the third-party certification rule talks about certification of international suppliers who are importing into the U.S., and that will help them get a little bit easier of access, essentially, is what it is. So either, you know, you may be considering GFSI for uh, – GFSI certification for – uh, because a, a customer is asking you to, or you again, you may have a, be asking of your suppliers or co-manufacturers to get a GFSI. So we'll talk a little bit about what, what GFSI is. The Global Food Safety Initiative is GFSI. It sets out basic requirements for food safety standards to make sure that the minimum is met by those food safety standards. If those food safety standards meet the minimum as set by the GFSI, then they will be t determined to be recognized and therefore they're equivalent to the GFSI benchmarking requirements. So that's what GFSI does. They set the standards that the standards have to meet. So three standards that are very common here in North America for the pet food industry. The first one we'll talk about is SQF, which is next. And SQF has got a food safety um, standard and a SQF quality code or quality certification standard. Uh, it, there's a section for the pet food industry. Uh, it would be food sector category number 34, and that essentially in the SQF world means modules two and two and four apply to the pet food world. Um, you can pet food folks can get just food safety, and many times the customers just ask for food safety certification, so that would just be the food safety code or they can go all the way to quality certification. These used to be levels two and three of SQF, and now they've been separated out to be food safety certification and quality certification. Now, one thing to talk a little bit about is that allergen management is required for the food safety certification for pet food facilities. So we'll talk about that in just a look on the next slide. Next, sir, please. Sir? Sorry, it should be should be switched. Are you seeing a BRC no. slide? No. Still seeing the SQF. Well, anyway, uh, what what uh, what would be going next is the allergen piece, and we'll talk a little bit about the allergens for SQF as we talked about allergen management requirement there. Um, in pet food, they are required under SQF to have a um, uh, an allergen management program. So it is mandatory for pet food facilities to have an allergen management program. Now, some folks uh, struggle with that a little bit because they say, well, allergens don't apply to animal food. Uh, that's not a regulatory requirement, so why should it be an SQF? Uh, um, but basically, SQF and, and many of the other standards have decided that even though, you know, allergens don't directly affect the animals, they certainly affect the consumers that handle the allergen food, and many times, you know, children or whatnot are, are, are uh, mistakenly or, or inadvertently eating some of the animal food or pet food. So allergen management is required. So what, so what has to happen is the pet food folks have to do a risk assessment to determine how much um, you know, risk is there from the product that is being handled. So for example, uh, you know, a canned, uh, uh, can of cat food maybe has much less risk, obviously, from consumers touching it than a pet treat, for example. Uh, so maybe a pet treat with a peanut butter flavoring uh, that pet food manufacturer would be expected to have, because peanuts are an allergen, would be expected to maybe label that product or have some type of allergen control in place to let the consumer know that there is an allergen in that product. Whereas a can of cat food that doesn't have an allergen in it, obviously there doesn't, there is no risk there. So there needs to be some sort of an allergen management program in place for pet food manufacturers, uh, listing of your allergens, including in your food safety plan, and again, assessment of those food allergens, uh, potentially product labeling could be a part of that. Again, there is no regulatory requirement for product labeling here in the United States, uh, but you still could label it as, again, as a notification for consumers. Now, it should be noted that pet feed, animal food, pet feed is not required to have an allergen management program because the thought process is there. It is not going to consumers. 
directly so, and not a lot of handling in the home, so therefore no, um, no allergen management program there is required. Okay, next, Sarah, we'll go to the BRC. So the BRC food safety standard, again, the, the largest food safety certification in, uh, in, in the world. Um, there is a uh, uh, pet food category would be category 11 of the 18 BRC standards or 18 BRC categories. Uh, the standard has no unique considerations for pet food. So essentially it's treated just like human food and you have to have a high care, high risk type, depending on what type of process and product that you have and you have to have those types of controls in place. Um, one thing to note about the BRC in October of this year, we will be seeing a new version, version eight. Uh, SQF just came out with their new version in uh, January of this year. Uh, and that is because GFSI has come out with their new version in 2017. So all the recognized standards have to kind of uh, keep up and continue to, um, to have their uh, their standards re-recognized and, and therefore they're they're making some revisions due to uh, change of requirements from the GFSI. Um, so the BRC will be having a new version coming out in October of this year. Uh, Al uh, Sarah, I'm still showing allergens on that. I don't know. There we go. Okay. Now on next slide, if we could to FSSC. Gary, I hate to tell you this, but it's it's actually just you. You're the one percent that can't view it. Okay, well, that's fine. We'll keep up then. Sorry. Uh, FSSC 22000, uh, version 4.1. Uh, again, this standard is based off of ISO 22000. Uh, there is a, a unique standard, but essentially for pet food, it, it is there is a, a similar cat a specific category for pet food, which is D2. Uh, but when again, the consideration is essentially it's the same as human food. So both the BRC and FSSC treat uh, pet food just like human food in the standard. There is no unique or separate activities or requirements. Um, there is the 22002-1 prerequisite program requirement and the ISO 22000 plus the FSSC requirements as well. So um, basically the pet food consideration there for FSSC is just like um, for human food, for the pet food. Uh, next slide. Now, as we get on past the standards, we look at things to say about, you know, what about things like, you know, obviously the FISMA rule and the food safety standards are built for, uh, you know, food safety management uh, and, and food safety hazard management. So when we think about food safety hazards, you know, two very prominent uh, food safety hazards come to mind. And, you know, we wanted to just real quickly describe that for uh, pet food facilities, much like human food, again, uh, from a regulatory standpoint, no ready-to-eat pet food can contain any salmonella species or listeria monocytogenes, which are both very prominent food safety pathogens for humans. So we have had, unfortunately, you know, quite a few recalls from salmonella in, in many dry uh, kibble or treats or whatnot and so even some listeria in some of the, the wet ty uh, types of processes. So this is just to give you an indication of the different types of processes where salmonella can actually be a risk from the environment or from ingredients. And certainly the listeria can be a risk in the environment of wet processing facilities as well. Um, so the, just to give you some examples there where in dry processing facilities, certainly salmonella must be considered in your hazard analysis and you must take controls to address that. And same with wet processing facilities, and there's some examples there on the screen. Listeria is your main risk of concern, and you must take controls to address that. Now, some of those controls to address that, in the next slide, we talk about environmental monitoring. And we flash back to FISMA now, and FISMA does require a verification activity when we have a product that is being produced that is ready to eat, and the ready to eat food is exposed to the environment, and there's a risk of environmental contamination. So certainly things like, you know, uh, dry, dry pet food, either dog or cat food that is dry, obviously ready to eat, going to be not obviously cooked or any further preparation by the consumer uh, prior to consumption. Treats would all be considered ready to eat. And th those are very high risk for post-process, pre-packaged, that area around that facility, in that facility, where we have that product that is exposed to the environment with a risk of environmental contamination, 
The Food Safety Modernization Act requires that you identify that as a sanitation preventive control and you undergo environmental monitoring as a verification activity. So this is the only place in FSMA where testing of anything is required. So this is where you must have an environmental monitoring program. Again, when you've got that ready to eat food that has the risk for environmental contamination. And when you do environmental monitoring, you see the requirements there on the screen. It must be scientifically valid. It must identify the test microorganisms. So again, for the dry facilities, that would be salmonella. For the wet facilities, that could be listeria. Specify your sampling locations and the number of samples to be collected, timing, frequency, identify the tests to be conducted, again, salmonella, listeria, et cetera, which lab is performing the, the, the testing, either an outside lab or your in-house lab, and then including your corrective action. If you have a result that you do not want, or if you have a positive, you must be, have to take a corrective action, and that must be included in your documented requirements as well. Now, when we, uh, next slide, please, sir. When we talk a little bit about the verification activities, some folks get confused between verification and validation. So I just want to take a quick second and, and talk about the difference. What is verification? Verification is, is, the, is the preventive control actually been implemented to address the food safety hazard. So verification activities include things like environmental monitoring. Has that salmonella been removed from the environment? Um, you know, record review is a, is a verification. Calibration of equipment, is that thermometer accurate? That's a verification activity. Uh, checking of my metal detector to make sure that the little wands get kicked out, that's a verification activity. Those are all verification activities to ensure that your preventive controls are in place. Now, validation, as we mentioned, validation has a specific requirement within the rule and validation is required. And this is also the same in, in the, the GFSI standards as well that the process preventive controls or your CCPs, critical control points, if you're used to that uh, terminology from HACCP days, uh, those must have a documented validation in your food safety plan. So therefore your process preventive control, so essentially your extruder, again, your uh, you know metal detector, any critical control points previously that you identified in your HACCP plan or now process preventive controls in your food safety plan, must have a documented validation. And that validation is essentially saying, if we apply the control as defined, we will control the hazard. So, you know, if the extruder temperature, you know, if we're targeting salmonella in our extruder temperature, will our extruder temperature actually kill salmonella? If we've got a high pressure process that we're applying, will it actually destroy the target pathogen of interest? So in the next slide there, we'll see uh, some specific described uh, specific requirements described again in the rule, and there is where it says you must validate those preventive controls, which are the process preventive controls. Um, and again, the validation of the preventive controls must be done or overseen by the preventive control qualified individual. So it's that PCQI who has to ensure that those process preventive controls have a documented validation as part of their food safety plan as they're building the food safety plan. So let me give you an example. In the next slide, we talk about, uh, we, I've mentioned extruder temperature a couple of times, and this is right out of the animal control, uh, preventive control qualified individual class. So we see here some death curves from uh, extruder temperatures. This is basically showing a six log reduction um, of E. coli, salmonella, and listeria in a, a, a product matrix that has undergone a certain time temperature destruction or intervention you know could be the extruder temperature so in the next slide we'll see that described and you can say you know we can reference uh some literature review we can do a modeling program um you know we can look at some internal research some internal studies that we've done all of those are appropriate validation activities to say Here's why we perform the process that we do, and we know if we perform it according to our criteria, it will work and it will destroy our target uh, food safety hazard of interest. So here's a couple of examples of, again, a, a reference material from literature, referencing a study, your own study, uh, modeling programs, or other ways to do that as well. So the key is, again, that preventive control qualified individual must have a documented validation as part of your food safety plan. So that's an important piece that sometimes 
Uh, some of our customers don't have that uh, quite in place when their compliance dates come up. I just wanted to mention real quickly before I, I cut off here that uh, FISMA compliance is, is you know, fully engaged now. Uh, we are, for the, for the pet food world, we are coming up upon the third um, GMP. So for those very small suppliers, the GMP provision goes into effect in September of this year. And for the medium size pet food facilities, their preventive control and food safety plans, and those are folks who have less than 500 employees, but more than $2.5 million in sales. Um, their preventive control food safety plan requirements go into effect in September of this year. Uh, the foreign supplier verification program rule have already had their first two implementation, in, implementation dates as well. So FISMA is, 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 you know, being fully engaged now and, and, you know, is expected to be, uh, you know, pretty much implemented for the animal food, pet food industry by September of this year. Pretty much everyone is expected to have it except those uh, very small suppliers under $2.5 million in sales. So with that, you see my uh, information there on the screen. Thank you very much. And I'll turn it back over to Sarah. Thank you so much, Gary. Um, so before we switch over um, to Carrie and Brett to talk about AFCO requirements, I'm going to launch a quick polling question for our audience, give everyone a moment to collect their thoughts after Gary's portion. And we have a quick question for the audience. Is your facility currently certified to a GFSI benchmark scheme? So I'll give everyone about a minute to reply. This is also a great time to submit questions to our presenters in the question panel. Um, please make sure that if you're submitting a question, it's a, a complete question. Sometimes it's difficult for us to understand what you're referencing because we're covering a lot of material. So I'll give everyone just a few moments. All right. Thank you, everyone, for participating. I'm going to close the poll, and I'll put the results up just so everybody can kind of see where the rest of the audience stands. Um, as an even split between yes and no, a lot of people who are in progress and another large portion who are considering. So it's always great to get more information about the people on our call. And with that, I'm going to move forward to AFCO requirements with Carrie and Brett. Would you guys like to introduce yourselves really quickly? Sure. Um, I'm Carrie Connor and I'm Senior Project Manager with Emphasis in Pet Food. I work here at the Nutrition Analysis Center in Des Moines, Iowa. Um, I've been with Eurofins for going on five years um, and I'll let Brett introduce himself. Yes, uh, as my cohort here said. I'm Brett Burke. I also work in the pet food industry here at our Nutrition Analysis Center in Des Moines. Been with Eurofins about three years now and have been working with pet food clientele since. I'm going to uh, introduce uh, the importance of AFCO and their requirements for this first section here and then Terry will take it away with uh, label claims after that. So it's always important to understand who AFCO is and also equally as important understanding who they are not and what they afford to uh, the members of the pet food industry. So plainly stated, the uh, AFCO is the Association of American Feed Control Officials. And contrary to popular belief, they are not a government uh, body Rather, they work with the government bodies, the USDA, FDA, as well as state agencies to develop guidelines for pet nutrition and as well as labeling guides. Uh, they are recognized on a national level. As I mentioned, USDA and FDA work very closely with AFCO. And they define acceptable verbiage as well as indicate 
acceptable ingredients for pet food formulation. They do release an annual publication that details all this information that is available via their website. Now, their requirements, they have a few, uh, depending on the items that you are manufacturing. So the bare minimum is the guaranteed analysis, which is a statement of the proximate values within your product, stating there is no more than these max values and no more than the minimum values, uh, no less than uh, these max values, sorry. Uh, and you can see that in this picture of the guaranteed analysis there. Uh, they also have statements for nutritional adequacy, which can be applied to your products should you do the chemistry testing that details you have met all the requirements for a either complete and balanced or all at stage formula. AFCO also uh, sets the guidelines for compliance. Now, our clientele who are interested in testing their products for uh, AFCO compliance, we do have full nutrition profiles, uh, different for each species, dog and cat, um, that we do have available. It details all the parameters that are listed in the annual publication, updated annually via AFCO uh, for all life stages, both growth and reproduction, as well as adult maintenance. We do also have a guaranteed analysis profile, as we have detailed in the previous slide, that we can deliver that also details calorie content as well as those proximate values. And we have comparative reports that we can provide that compare the results of your product compared to what AFCO set for either growth and reproduction or values for adult maintenance. Now, in summary, AFCO is very important in your pre-production consideration for all pet products, may they be diets or treats. Uh, the requirements do vary by these products. If you have a main diet, you may consider doing a complete AFCO profile, whereas a treat, you may consider just the guaranteed analysis as it's for supplemental feeding. Uh, testing does substantiate these claims that you're making in your packaging, so we have services available to accommodate that. Now, with that, I will pass along to my colleague, Carrie, who will discuss label claims. So, as Brett mentioned, there are several uh, requirements to make certain claims on your product. Um, to briefly go over what label claims are, label claims can either be numeric values, such as uh, content in a percentage for a vitamin or minerals or such as that guaranteed analysis example that we showed earlier um, where you see the minimum and maximum percentage or it can also be verbiage so when we're talking about verbiage um, things like stating that it's non-gmo or um, even something as simple as the title of what the product is if you claim that it is a platter or a recipe and then you list um, chicken behind it, so you say it's a, or in front of it, so you say that it's a chicken platter. That's indicating to the um, purchaser that this, the product that you're selling contains a minimum of 25% chicken or whatever ingredient that you're listing. Uh, so it's really important to understand what numeric value or nutrient claims you're wanting to make alongside what verbiage claims you're wanting to make. <clears throat> What types of label claims? So oftentimes we are asked, um, and a lot of times it's by startups or smaller businesses, what type of label claims may be relevant to their product or what they should be listing on their product. Um, as we had mentioned, it's important to always have the guaranteed analysis as a bare minimum. Every product requires that. It is the, the base requirement for um, the, the packaging and the nutrient content on the packaging. The intended use of the product is important to understand as well. Is If it's a main diet, that product should be evaluated for nutritional adequacy. Um, 
supplements are also super relevant to label claims because supplements have to have a purpose. So what is the purpose? Is it a joint supplement? Um, is it for skin and hair? So it's important to understand what you want the intended use of the product to be um, in order to know what label claims you want. The next thing that we look at is what beneficial compounds or components are in the product. So if your product has a lot of fatty acids in it and you know that there's going to be a lot of omegas in it, that's probably a relevant thing to claim. Um, the same thing goes for items like glucosamine, chondroitin, other beneficial uh, vitamins, minerals, um, items of that source. Label claim verification plays a large role in what you can put on your product as well. So just because you think something is in your product doesn't necessarily mean that it's, it is there or it is there in the quantity that you're expecting it to be there. Um, certain ingredients can interact with each other and cause degradation, um, as well as exposure to other environmental factors such as light or heat um, during processing. So it's important that just because you formulate to a certain amount um, that you actually have analytical testing to support the value that you're claiming on the product um, in your post-processing finished um, product. So we'll also talk about stability later today, um, so I won't touch too much on that here, but it's important to understand the compound stability, whether you're evaluating it through your processing um, and looking at that final product versus the formulation, um, or when you're, we're talking about the actual shelf life of the product, so that compound stability in your product over time, such as uh, things that are susceptible to degradation like fatty acids and vitamins. Label claims show consumers the benefit of your product. So why does the consumer want to buy your product? Oh, because it can do X, Y, and Z for your pet, or it's, it's got um, a high amount of a certain compound in it. Um, it. It's important, again, to understand what claims you want to make on your product and why, because they are vastly different from product to product. A supplement is not likely going to have the same label claims listed as a main diet source or a treat. Label claims should be verified to prove potency, as mentioned in the previous slide. Um, it's important to verify that your formulation, um, you know, the, the, the end product that you're actually putting on the shelf for a consumer to purchase meets the claim that you're putting on your label, um, both from a shelf life standpoint and from um, a formulation standpoint. All right. Thank you so much, Brett and Carrie. Timing was perfect on that. Way to go, everybody, in session one. We're going to move into question and answer. So now is a great time for everyone to submit your questions. You can submit your questions using the question box in your GoToWebinar dashboard, or you can tweet questions at your opens on Twitter, twitter.com. I'll give everybody a few minutes to get their questions in. And then just so everyone's aware of next steps, after this, we're going to take a short break before we move into session two. But before we do that, I do have a question from the audience for Gary really quickly. Um, before the webinar even started, someone submitted a question to the organizers asking if they need specific FISMA hazard analysis to be FISMA compliant or if HACCP risk assessments meet that criteria. Uh, great question, and uh, we get that quite a bit. Uh, actually, the the has the, the HACCP hazard analysis is close to meeting the FISMA requirements, but it does not fully get there. It, it's very close, but the, the issue with the HACCP hazard analysis is that it's focusing only on critical control points. And it is, and you know, there's, there's a couple of steps in the HACCP hazard analysis where it talks about, you know, will there be other controls that address this? And you may say, yes, pest control or yes, allergen management or yes sanitation or something like that and, and you might say so this is not a ccp because it's going to be addressed by some of those other programs um the, the issue with the fisma hazard analysis is many you know a few of those other programs like sanitation 
may be, or supplier, may be a preventive control as well. So the, the HACCP um, food safe, uh, hazard analysis does not address those preventive controls, whereas the FISMA hazard analysis must include consideration for when one of those identified food safety hazards has to be addressed by a preventive control. So it's probably, you know, 85, 90% of the way there to have your HACCP hazard analysis be your FISMA hazard analysis, but you have to reevaluate it. it. Has to be done by the preventive control qualified individual, and it has to really consider, are there any of those food safety hazards that need to be addressed by a preventive control in addition to obviously the critical control point, which is the process preventive control. So those sanitation preventive controls, those supplier preventive controls, those need to be identified from that hazard analysis as well. And your HACCP hazard analysis won't do that. All right, thanks, Gary. Um, next question I think will be for Carrie and Brett and anybody else who wants to jump in, any of our presenters. But someone asked, um, do labeling requirements relate just to finished products going to market, or do they apply to ingredients sold from a supplier to a pet food manufacturer? So with regards to what we're discussing here, we're mostly discussing finished products. Um, there are certainly considerations for ingredients. You know, I know that some ingredient manufacturers are making specific claims, and it's probably important to verify ingredients as well, but what we're um, discussing specifically is considerations for final products. This is Lars here. Uh, one of the questions that uh, come up is that AFCO has clear definition of what ingredients are supposed to be and supposed to uh, meet in terms of specifications. So even though you don't have to put them on the label, the AFCO handbook gives you some idea of what to expect when you buy a certain ingredient. And we have a lot of great questions coming in that I think will tie well into our session two topics, all about ingredient considerations. Um, another one for Gary here, if you strictly use co-manufacturers, do you need to maintain a supplier preventive control program for each co-man? Uh, yeah. I mean, if uh, if you're strictly co if you strictly use co-manufacturers, uh, you really you yourself do not have to comply with FISMA. So that's one important piece of that. I mean, if you're if you're a a purchasing company or a branded type marketing company, um, you know you don't manufacture the product, therefore you do not have to be compliance with FISMA. So that's an important point. Uh, same with. Same with brokers. Um, unless they're an importer, they don't really have to comply with, with the preventive control rule or, or foreign supplier verification program. So if you're dealing only with co-manufacturers, you don't manufacture any of the product yourself, you do not have to comply with FISMA. Uh, but obviously, from a business uh, continuity standpoint, from a, from a make sure that you're okay from a business standpoint, certainly you'd want to make sure those co-manufacturers are, of course, meeting you know, FISMA at a minimum and, you know, potentially even maybe asking them to go to a GFSI certification to, you know, ensure consistency and food safety management. Uh, but, you know, so that you don't have any interruption of any of those co-manufacturers and having product, you know, non-conforming or even placed on hold or having some, you know, FDA warning letters or whatnot issued, you know, highly recommend as a co-manufacturing marketing brand owner, certainly going out visiting with those co-manufacturers, making sure that they're FISMA compliant, making sure their paperwork's in place, making sure they've got a PCQI identified, um, you know, potentially again, expect asking them to get to a, a GFSI recognized certification, you know, for due diligence to protect your, your customers and your supply chain and your brand. I think that's an important consideration. All right, thank you, Gary. Um, another question came in earlier in our presentation. Eric asked, can the required documented validation or the CCP step be from other sources not provided by the company selling the product? This sure. is Lars, yeah. my understanding. Okay. Sorry, Lars, go ahead. Yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. No, go ahead, Gary. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, uh, certainly, uh, you know, the validation documentation can be, as I said, can be from literature review of other people's studies. 
uh, can be from a modeling program. It can be from a lot of, of outside sources rather than, an, you know, an internal validation study. Certainly that would work as well, but that is not the only, um, you know, source of information that you have access to. Obviously with the, you know, the internet and, and all the other works that's been done out there, you know, odds are someone's probably put together a study that they put on, you know, in a publication that you can reference that's got a matrix very similar to yours or exactly like yours and a process very similar to yours that you can that you can reference. Lars, anything you want to add there? You did well. <laughs> Seal of approval. All right, and then last question, I think, before we go into break. Um, this one's more situational, but it also came in before our live broadcast began. If a human grade A dairy product is an off grade commodity and sold as an ingredient for pet food manufacturing, how or what sections of FISMA apply to that facility? Okay, that's scary. Um, that would be under the CGMPs, uh, under 507, as I said, that last section there that talks about the human uh, byproducts. So, again, that would be a human byproduct that is now meant as an ingredient for animal food. So essentially what that says there is that the GMP portion of the 507 rule applies, which essentially means that you have to properly label that product. It has to be properly temperature controlled. In that case, as with the dairy product, most likely it has to be temperature controlled as well. It has to be properly labeled, protected, covered, uh, you know, protected from contamination, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So treated as a, a true ingredient and not more of an inedible byproduct. So uh, Section 507, the CGMPs Part B of that rule would apply to that situation. 